Eddie, I appreciate you joining me on the show today. I'm excited to talk to you for a couple different reasons. A, I think you uh, are a fantastic business owner, entrepreneur. You do things really well. And I also am excited to talk about the marketing piece uh, from a pure business perspective. The only way business works is generating revenue. The way you generate revenue and growth is through marketing, which uh, just drives the growth engine. So Thanks for joining us here today. Thanks for having me, man. Super excited, um, you know, uh, for everyone that's listening. Uh, Patrick and his team handle all my money and tell me what to do with it. So we have a very intimate relationship over the last few years. Yes. Thank you. Um, and it's been fun to have a front row seat to to all the the cool things that you're you're doing. So I, I just appreciate when we we think about business owners. I had a mentor of mine tell me once that you you grow at the rate in which you make decisions. And I look at how you uh, have grown so quickly. And I love how you will take in the information. You know how much data you need before you can be like, "Yep, I'm in" or "I'm out." Uh, and so, where did that come from? How did how did you develop that that skill? Because I think it's it's valuable, and I don't think many people do it very well. Yeah, I um, I appreciate that. Um, so I'll tell you, I think I think for me, uh, I just think about it. I've, I've always thought like logically, things just over time in my life. Um, uh, but like logically speaking, if me and you have a year, and um, now now obviously each decision you make is a different size, right? Who you marry is different than what you're eating for lunch today. Mm -hmm. Um, but on the, at the grand scheme of things, if I'm making 10,000 decisions this year and you are making 100, uh, I'm likely going to be living, you know, maybe not a hundred X what you are, uh, but let's just say five to 10 X maybe, right? Uh, mm -hmm. not even just in business, but in life, um, because yeah. you're lagging on your decisions and you're wasting all this time when you have all the information necessary to make the decision yet you're lagging for no reason. And if you don't know the answer, it's practically a coin flip, right? And it's going to be a coin flip in a week. And it's mm -hmm. probably gonna be more of a coin flip in a week because that data and information is further from the day you made the decision. And so I just look at it as like, what's the point of wasting time having this decision take up mental space? Cause let's, let's be honest, man, these things like they sit in your brain and if you mm -hmm. don't like take them out and like, answer them or decide on them like they're they're there it's like oh you got to have this conversation with this person don't forget and it just kind of sits there and it bothers you and it takes a mental bandwidth and space and so uh, i just try to make a decision as quickly as possible and even with you right like you bring me a lot of really good tax strategies and we were just talking about this like the moment that you're giving me information on the strategy and i've decided i don't want to do it for whatever reason i don't even let you keep i'm just like hey okay cool it's not not an option don't bring this up to me again for these reasons you know what i mean yeah um, and I just think speed, I think speed wins, especially in yeah. today's world. I, I love that. And we're going to get to that later, but so we make decisions and as entrepreneurs regularly, we're screwing things up. Uh, and we have to adjust. So how do you handle like, okay, I got into something. It wasn't as awesome as I thought it was going to be. Now I need to adjust. Uh, the data is telling me that this isn't, this isn't working out well. How do you handle those decisions that maybe, uh, weren't home runs? Um, it just depends. So one, is this something that, uh, I still think is worth pursuing and the opportunities there, but maybe it's not as quickly as I want it to be. Yes. Let's keep doing it Two, Uh, is this just something that we have to accept is a sinking hole of money that we'll keep feeding in hopes with really low odds that we're going to succeed at it? Uh, like example, I mean, you've been me through this and I guess these are things I can say, right? Cause it's my info. So, um, mm -hmm. Like I built a software company to piggyback off of a marketing company that I built. So I built a marketing company for certain kinds of businesses. Then I built a software company for those businesses because I saw there's a massive need in the marketplace. Spent probably a quarter million dollars, a couple of years worth of time in doing so. COVID wiped out the whole industry. Uh, it hurt the marketing side. So we weren't able to keep feeding clients to the software. Uh, and because I couldn't actively think about growing the software company, this money was just sinking every month on developers, on sales team, whatever it was. And it just wasn't bearing the fruits of what I wanted it to be. Right. Um, and there's an opportunity cost to everything uh, when it comes to your time. And so I had to make the decision to cut off something that I probably all in probably spent 400, 500 K that's a huge home run. That's a fully built operating software that my businesses run on mm -hmm. just because I have opportunities that are maybe much bigger, quicker. Um, yeah. and it's okay. I had to cut that off, but there are times when we launch things 
and they don't do as well as we want them to in the first six months. Um, mm-hmm. Like a restaurant business that I bought, um, I bought the restaurant business. We wanted to grow it, but we actually paused for six months and we had to fix a bunch of stuff, like pulling back an arrow, essentially. We had to mm-hmm. fix a bunch of stuff in order to get to a point where we can expand and grow. We still believe the opportunity was what it was, so we didn't abandon it. We just yeah. changed our forecasts or expectations of what it's going to look like. I love it. And, and I think that that example there also leads me to the next thing. You, I think you see opportunity uh, with partnerships and, and working with operators that uh, maybe have skill sets that you don't have. Can you talk a little bit about what are those characteristics? Because you're, you're regularly putting together uh, deals where you're investing in companies or bringing on partners to uh, work together. And I'm sure everybody that you're probably looking at new opportunities every day and not everybody makes it through the Eddie filter. So what, what does that, what does that filter look like? How are you deciding, Hey, this guy knows how to make things happen. Yeah. Um, with, okay. So there's, there's two sides, there's people and there's opportunity. So how do I look at the opportunity? How do I look at the people? Uh, the people is a hard one because, um, I'm over opportunistic with people. I trust people too easily. Uh, because I, I'm, I'm saying this like as humbly as possible. I'm a really good person, and therefore, like ethically, morally, like I have never screwed anyone. Um, yep. And I automatically kind of assume that that's human nature because of that self reflection. Yeah. Uh, I think that's why, like people who like lie a lot, think that you're lying all the time, right? Uh, mm-hmm. It's just kind of a self reflection of what they would be doing. Yeah. Um, and so I get punished for that. So I do make a lot of bad decisions in partnerships. I've probably been screwed once a year from a partner in some sort of company. Uh, maybe once every two years, let's say, uh, on average, which sounds awful. But in those two years, I'm making eight partnerships. If I'm getting screwed on one of them because I made a wrong read or two of them, um, I think that's just like the law of averages at that point. Uh, but what I do look for, I, most importantly, is someone who I think I trust is the number one factor. And number two, Uh, Are they self-driven to do the things uh, that I direct them to do? Because I'm kind of at a point where I don't have a lot of time to do things. So I have to direct people to do things and then they have to do those things. Um, And so from that standpoint, like, can they self-direct themselves sometimes and not have to have me tell them all the time what to do? I think is super important. Um, But I'll tell you in every business, Patrick, um, there's two sides. There's revenue and there's operations. Um, Mm -hmm. and that's kind of how I break down it. It's offense, defense, just like any sport, like the whole world revolves around push and pull offense, defense, whatever it is. Business is the same. Mm -hmm. And so depending on the business, where does my skill set lie? Is it on offense or defense? And I'm looking for the opposite. So when I bought the restaurant business, I knew my skill set was branding, marketing, bringing in more revenue, fixing the marketing systems, the, uh, the POS system, what the menu looks like, the branding of the business, everything, and then getting money from investors. Mm -hmm. I knew I could do that, but I knew I definitely never wanted to step into a kitchen. I definitely never want to run a location. I definitely never want to fry a French fry. I never Mm -hmm. want to serve anyone. It's not what I want to do and I will never do it. Um, And so I needed someone to play defense, which was that side of the business. And so I went to all the restaurants that are currently working. I picked the one that was doing the best financially and on the ground. And I made those people my business partners for the main franchise to run the whole thing. And so I'm just finding those gaps on the other side of offense or defense that I can't play on in that business. Cause you never want to, I mean, you can play both sides to start the business, but eventually your first hire should be the opposite side anyways. Right. So that's kind of how I'm gauging people that I get into business with, but I make a lot of mistakes. You know, I get screwed by people all the time. Yeah. I, I love that. I, I generally default to trusting people. I just feel like I'm going to give you the, the chance to, like we're going to do business together until you give me a reason not to trust you. And then, then we're probably done. Uh, but, um, uh, I agree. I just feel like life is so much easier when, uh, and moves so much smoother when I just default to trusting people. And I learned that the hard way that you, everybody's not like me. Uh, when I first started with rental property, you know, I'm, I'm hustling, I'm, you know, collecting the rents and people are telling me like, you know, my grandma died, my car needs fixed. Like I'll pay you next week. I was such a sucker, you know, um, I was, uh, gave people the benefit of the doubt. And then all of a sudden I'm, I'm funding their, their housing. So, uh, <laughs> I've learned a lot of lessons in those, uh, those time frames. but, um, I think in general it's, uh, it's paid off for me as well. So that's, uh, it's good. Very good. Yeah. So 
I appreciate the the insight to Eddie as an entrepreneur. I love the uh, the push pull, the offense defense. I think that that makes a lot of sense. You need both sides of the equation, right? Like, I'm, it doesn't matter how much revenue I generate if I can't operate the business, and if I operate really well and can't you know generate any revenue, it uh, it doesn't work. So I think that leads me to the next thing. Uh, you own and operate bad marketing. Uh, bad stands for bold and disruptive, which I think is brilliant. And so, thank you. Yeah, uh, the the marketing just drives revenue into um, you know businesses, and I think you do a great job of that. You can you just give us an outline overview of all the different uh, maybe businesses that Eddie's involved in that sort of sit in this this marketing space, and then we'll sort of dig into marketing. Meaning, like the types of businesses we work with as an agency. Yeah, that would be good. And then I'm also thinking of Eddie as entrepreneur, like here's all of the different things that we're doing to, uh, from a business perspective around the marketing space. Cause you know, if it's okay, we can edit this out, but like we've got agency founders, we've got bad marketing, we've got all of these different things that we're doing around marketing to, yep. um, you know, just be profitable, uh, within the marketing space. So yeah. yeah. Do you I want to talk, talk through all. that? Or? Yeah, I can talk okay. about it. just around the marketing space, not the other yeah. companies. Yeah, I think that's that's worthwhile. Okay, cool. I was about to say we're gonna be here for a while. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, we are. Uh, so, okay, cool. So, uh, bad marketing essentially overview. Like we work with uh, three categories of businesses, either like local type businesses on a small scale who are serving like a local market. So I'll give an example. Would be like uh, car. Uh, custom car shop where they like change the color of your car or change your seats or wheels or whatever it is uh, high ticket. They sell like thousands of dollar items. That's one category. Number two is e-commerce, um, which is uh, basically tied for the biggest category in our company. We have about a hundred employees on that side. Uh, and that's basically anything on Amazon, anything you buy that ships to your door. Um, that's, that's in that category. And then number three is um, basically <sighs> sales, or info related products, meaning anything from an, a national insurance company uh, that wants to generate leads and spend millions of dollars a month on Facebook and Instagram and Google, uh, all the way to someone who's selling courses online on how to get into real estate. Um, basically anything that requires lead generation digitally at a limitless scale, meaning they're not confined within the walls of how many people fit in this building. It's just how many people can I reach on the internet to buy this uh, yeah. product. So that's, that's what we do. And then yeah. essentially there's a few parts of our business. Each one of those is actually its own entity, um, mm -hmm. which is pretty cool. So like local business is one, e-commerce is one. Um, and then basically I went and acquired other agencies and created partnerships um, with those owners to come be equity partners in bad marketing. So bad marketing owns a portion of their company and then they own the other portion. So that would be like our Amazon department. We have an overseas department in Europe. Um, so we created partnerships like that. So there are multiple entities under bad marketing that have different partners because we went and acquired instead of like, you know, instead of going and let's just say, you know, you're doing tax advice and then you want to get into, I don't know, uh, running a brokerage so that all your yeah. clients can have their money in there. Like you wouldn't want to go try to figure out how to start a brokerage. You'd want to figure out how to go and partner up with a brokerage or like find a brokerage that's yep. small and take it over. It's just a lot faster. So that's basically what we did. It's like, why sit here and try to learn Amazon when we could just get the best person at Amazon to come do that for us. Um, yep. And so that's what we did. And then we also educate the agency space. So we have like an agency founders ecosystem, which is essentially like from as cheap as 99 bucks a month to like a digital program and community where like marketing agency owners can all network and hang out. And there's a few thousand people in there. Um, mm -hmm. to an event that costs five ten thousand dollars to attend uh, once a year uh, all the way up to you know a thirty five thousand dollar like coaching program where they become a part of a year-long membership and work only with other you know multi-million dollar marketing agencies so that they can all collaborate share ideas and you know bring stuff there so not only are we marketing but we're helping other marketing agencies become better as a yeah. whole I love that and my guess is building all of those ecosystems, you have your finger on the pulse of what's working, what's not working in the marketing space. Cause I, I look at how dynamic it is, you know, yesterday, Google ads were working today. They're not, you know, Facebook changes the algorithm. Now I'm, you know, uh, in trouble. So 
can you just talk through a little bit about like obviously being involved with that that network of other uh, agencies, having so many different clients, testing new things. How, how are you staying on top of all of the marketing opportunities out there? Um, the reality is we're not. Just like any businesses, we have to say no to certain verticals that we aren't. We don't believe enough to play in yet. So, example. Uh, we were literally like probably one of the first people ever to be able to run ads on TikTok uh, just because we had massive famous people that we were managing and they got access first and then we got to start playing with it. Uh, it was really cheap, but it was horrible. It didn't produce dollars. Um, and so we gave it a shot for like nine months, 12 months. Maybe we built an entire department around it, a team, content, ads, whatever, everything. It didn't work out. <clears throat> we said, hey, you know what? Let's not touch this again for a while. So we backed off it. We kept some clients on there that were doing really well. But like overall, we weren't crushing it for people. So we didn't feel right ethically selling the service. And so even though everyone, I'm telling you everyone, I could have made an extra 15 million that year just selling that. Uh, but we just didn't. We knew that it wasn't producing the results. Then a year later, TikTok shop comes out. Uh, biggest opportunity ever at the time we're like not again here we go so we're like do we invest let's wait and then we waited a year and we missed a massive wave because of it but now we're 100 confident it works and we do it for our clients and we make them money and that's okay that we missed a wave and a ton of money but like we're at the point where the business is so mature that like putting all those resources into something and then having it fail like that is not worth putting in another year of it when we could just do something else um, so you can't stay on top of every trend is my answer, but here's what's important. I think marketing as a whole has not changed in a hundred years. Um, what changes is the tools that we use to, um, consume the marketing. So all marketing is, is just generating attention, uh, from people that generates, you know, some sort of inquiry or interest in a product or service that, you know, ends up getting them to buy um, and so back in the day when, you know, it first started, it was in newspapers, then it was on billboards, then it was on TV or radio, then it was on TV. Now it's on phones. And over time, the oldest one mm -hmm. kind of fades away in a way. Right. Yep. But like, for example, right now, everyone's like, Oh, I got to get on social media, all this stuff. Yeah, true. But like 40 years ago, people were sending mailers and everyone was buying stuff. And guess what? Everyone stopped sending mailers because it's not the thing that everyone talks about anymore. And so now because no one sends mailers, everyone still has a mailbox, that attention is still there and no one's taking advantage of it. And so all you're doing from a marketing standpoint is trying to find underpriced attention that you can get and you can leverage on just like a stock. If I can get to the same person for $5 um, one way uh, through one direction, but I can get to that same person for $20 on a different app or source, my goal is to find those $5 ones instead of those $20 ones and invest as much money as I can into there to be able to attract those customers for less. I love that. So I know you've taken businesses from almost zero revenue or, or, Hey, here's an idea to they've engaged with you and your company and created tremendous amounts of revenue in pretty short order. When, when somebody comes to you, what is the, the like onboarding? How do you assess which, which channels to go generate attention through and and get people interested in in looking at those. And I'm sure it's different in each one of those those you know companies you talked about. Brick and mortar is going to be different than e-commerce than coaching and info products. But actually it's not even about the category. Um, it doesn't matter if it's info or local or e-commerce. Um, the category of business doesn't matter. It's the actual business entity itself and what do they sell that matters. Uh, if you think about it this way, uh, Facebook, Instagram, all these things are the equivalent of television back in the day. Um, mm -hmm. You watch it and you consume whatever's coming your way, but you're not specifically looking for anything that's being sold to you. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just a matter of how well can they convince me I need or want this thing in the next 30 seconds. And if mm -hmm. they can't, I'm not making that purchase now. Maybe I'll do it later, like when I see it again versus Google, which used to be like yellow pages, where I'm going with the intent of I need to find a plumber and I'm going mm -hmm. to Google to do so. So the platform is actually based on the kind of business that you have. Is it a kind of business where a large volume of people are searching for that product or solution at a mass scale or even just the problem that you solve, right? If people are like, you know, um, yeah, 
my electricity keeps turning off in my house. What do I do? Like, it would be great to run an electrician ad as the number one spot, right? Uh, so it doesn't need to be like, I need an electrician. Um, but if it's a business where people are inquiring for those problems and solutions, then you want to go on a search engine like Google, like Bing, even YouTube, because YouTube is Google. Therefore, mm -hmm. like you can run video ads to people based on what they search. So if you search something for a plumber today over the next two weeks, I could show you plumber ads and you'd be like, man, I need a plumber. Um, mm -hmm. What perfect timing. You know what I mean? So whereas Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok uh, are usually not search based platforms. They're attention based platforms, which means you're going to go put yourself in front of someone and interrupt whatever they're doing uh, and hope that you made a good enough video or image to be able to capture their attention to stop doing what they're doing and just listen to you for 20 seconds or read what you have to say. And so they're just two different forms of marketing. And so I think um, it just depends on the business that you have. If you have a really good offer or a really good product that people need and don't usually have around the house, or you can show why there's value in it, you can infinitely scale with Facebook, Instagram, television, because there's infinite amount of spots of media. You can mm -hmm. just spend billions of dollars and it would spend. Uh, whereas on Google, everyone has a ceiling. The ceiling is how many people are searching for these things and how many words can you find and phrases that people are searching for that lead to someone buying your product. And once you spend all the money to get all of it, there's no more to go. And so it's just two different things. I don't think it's based on the kind of local or online business. It's based on what is the product or service that I'm selling. Yeah, that's a fantastic distinction. I never have thought about those channels that, uh, I can advertise on in, in those, those, those ways. So that's, that's good. And, and really I like the, um, you know, the scale piece, right? If I've got a product that I'm pushing out and I can spend a dollar on advertising and it generates $2 of revenue and I still profit from that, like I can dial that up, like you said, to a billion dollars and, uh, it, it works out well. Do you see limits to that? Is there, is there times where that just like there is a ceiling in some capacity or um, there's not a ceiling of spend, but it's a, there's a, there's a line of marginal returns. So if I can get a five X return at a hundred thousand dollars a month, if I spend $200,000 a month, so I'll get a perspective. Let me, let me simplify it. Uh, I get a five X return at a hundred thousand dollars a month means I make 500 K. So um, I would have a 400 K spread. Uh, if I spend $200,000 a month and I get a, you know, 4x return instead of a five, I now have a $600 spread on $800. So even though my return is less, my total money is more. Therefore, mm -hmm. it's worth the marginal return or sorry, diminishing return is what I meant to say. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a diminishing return, right? So as I spend more, it becomes much harder to be as profitable as I was at lower spends. But there's also a point where it's the opposite, where you spent so much, there's so much brand recognition that actually all your cost of marketing goes down because now you're acquiring twice the customers on the same budget because they're used to seeing bad marketing everywhere. And so now they know it. And so now when they see it, the likelihood of them engaging or making a decision is much higher than what it used to be two years ago when you never had any marketing. So yeah. it's kind of a weird curve, but that is the ceiling. Yep. Interesting. Uh, I love it. So you talked a little bit about brand for a second, because I, I think that's something that, you know, when I, if I rewind to, you know, television, like the, the brand recognition really, really mattered, you know, and it was like, oh, hey, I want to be associated with that because I, you know, they're, they're at the cool pool party and that, that aligns with me. It wasn't necessarily going, oh, that fits a, a need that I have, you know, it was more of a, a subconscious thing. Is branding still as important as it used to be? You know, I feel like I used to be able to just go buy, you know, TV ads and sort of make it work. But now attention seems so spread out that it's hard to get my brand top of mind. Or is that not the case? Because attention is so spread out, brand is so much more important. Uh, because uh, really what it is, is brand recall. So if you, if you let's think about it mathematically as a formula, uh, if there is way more... Uh, attention being taken up. That means each point of recall, meaning I remember this brand is worth so much more because instead of a hundred, instead of 10 brands that they've seen and they remember yours, now they're seeing a hundred and they're remembering yours. Therefore brand recall is actually more important and, you know, financially necessary than, than ever before. Yeah. Um, so I think it's super important. I'll tell you, I even ran a test 
where I would run the same ads that we're running for ourselves on other pages that were not ours. Uh, mm-hmm. It wasn't bad marketing. Um, and it, it didn't have the Instagram profile that we have that looks so beautiful that everyone can look at. Um, and our cost was like 5x higher just to run it. We ran the same ads, wow. the same offer to the same audiences, just from a different like name, entity, and like existence. Uh, Mm -hmm. and it costs us more money. And so I think that's something that's super important to reflect and be like, I mean, if this isn't a clear indicator of brand value, uh, I don't know what is. Then we turned it back on and we reduced our cost by five. So that's fantastic. Yeah. So uh, that leads me to the question of like, uh, how do people develop the brand? Right? Like you, you talked about Instagram and there's some of the social channels. Is it creating good content and just sort of being out there in the world where people, are constantly seeing you is it i guess i'm a little bit lost as to how yeah how that, no it's a great question brand development so is. um all all brand is is how people perceive you mm-hmm. and how they perceive you determines how they interact with you so i might perceive your brand a certain way therefore i don't want to interact with it and vice versa i might you know perceive it a certain way and so it all comes from the brand story and what are the values of that brand and what do they represent? So like, what's the mission of this brand? Uh, what's the story? How did they start? Uh, people really care about these things. So believe it or not, like in the marketing world, some of our best campaigns are when we're talking about the story of the brand owner and how his hair was falling out. And because his hair was falling out, no shot at you, Patrick. Um <laughs> Then he decided he had to travel the world for years to come up with the best hair loss solution. And then he grew his hair back and now he's doing it for other people. What an awesome story. Look at the thousands of people that he's helped. It's, it screams yeah. confidence, blah, blah, blah. That's, that's, that is the brand, right? And that's why people mm-hmm. buy from that person versus, you know, um, I don't know, Nivea Men's, for example, hair loss solution or Hims. Uh, it's because yeah. of that brand that they, that it represents. And so like, in my case, for example, bad marketing, like that's not for everyone. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. that's okay. The thing is, if you build a brand to be okay with everyone, you will never be great with any certain pocket of people. And therefore, you'll never grow like that. And so you have to pick a side, just like politics. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think both candidates go up and all make the same points. They have to dispute each other because there is a side to each each point, right? There's people who okay. think, pro-abortion and there's people who think you know pro-life and it's Mm -hmm. always going to be like that and so when you're defining a brand you need to say what do we represent and who do we want to interact with and buy from us right i as a marketing person finally decided i don't want to work with like lame people who like don't want to be exciting and marketing and just be super boring like we can do the boring stuff but then like we need some budget for like the stuff that's a little bit out of pocket that can make us a hundred X return instead of a two X return. Right. Uh, and right. that's the game I wanted to play. And you, you know that from managing my money, right? Like yeah. I hate, I hate those slow, long term returns. And so, yeah. so that we decided we want to be bad marketing, just like liquid death. Like it's not for everyone. It's polarizing, but like yeah. the person who gets it, who's like, I like that. That's, that's who yeah. I want to work with at, at yeah. the first place. Right. And so I, I, I guess it. I know that was a long answer, but that's brand. no, that's that's fantastic, and and I think people should absolutely go check out uh, the bad marketing and Eddie Malouf Instagram because you you've put some really good stuff out there on uh, that just gives people flavor for for who you are and how you attack attract att- attract attention. And every time I see you know something coming up, I'm I'm excited to see what you have uh, going out into the world. So uh, yeah, I, I totally agree and. You know, you you think about. I, I like to use the example of a beige Camry. Like nobody gets excited about a beige Camry. Like it's a car that will transport me from point A to point B. But it's like I would rather have the, uh, we'll call it uh, lime green Lamborghini. Okay, um, the lime green Lamborghini is either you love it or you hate it, and that's okay. Like let's uh, let's just be very clear on on where we stand on these things because I don't I don't want somebody being like, eh, that's okay. Uh, I want somebody to look at what we do and how we do it and go, yes, I'm either really excited about that or those people are crazy. And uh, it's funny you picked that scenario of the green Lambo because when I was buying my Lamborghini, I was picking Mm -hmm. and my friends got telling me to pick the green and I just felt like it was a little too childish. 
and like <laughs> i loved it but i like yeah. didn't love it for me mm -hmm. it was like such a it's funny that's such a funny scenario because i was like on the line either way and i like mm -hmm. literally love it or hate it. i couldn't even decide which one i wanted i was like do i love yeah. it do i hate it it's one of them i feel it i just don't know what it is mm -hmm. and eddie ended up with the blue lamborghini and it's it's a sharp looking car i so, love that car uh, yeah um i don't i don't blame you i i think at some point you know the the responsible financial guy in me like i want a ferrari sitting in my garage i'm just it's not there yet uh, look i'll challenge you on that for a second um okay. you as a financial advisor with a ferrari uh especially now that you're making more content too we'll get you much more clientele mm -hmm. online uh, in the areas that you live in, you will start connecting with other people who own other Ferraris and Lamborghinis, et cetera, which are probably your ideal clients as well. And it will end up paying for itself and you will experience a different side of life that you will not have access to without the cars. No matter how much money you have, there's a side of life that you can only access with those luxury vehicles. And it is what it is. It's like the, it's like the entry ticket for it. And so... Yep. I think you would ROI a lot. Obviously, you don't make a lot of video content like I do, but that has helped me a lot for sure mm -hmm. uh, from that side. But even if I was in your shoes, I think I would benefit much more from my car because I would actually be giving people financial advice and tax advice. And when I go to these, you know, we went to a track and all drove our exotic cars as hard as we could mm -hmm. for, you know, six hours. Yep. There's 50 of us. All of them run massive companies, insurance companies, real estate companies. Every car is 400, 500 grand. And uh, some of them, it's like their 10th car. And, um, you know, those are all people that would be ideal clients for Patrick, but not Eddie, because I don't work with any business. You know what I mean? But like you work with anyone who has money, technically, right? As yeah. a market. Somebody so. with a tax problem that wants some help getting they organized. All, it's like, yep. They all want to be able to buy an extra car every year. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, look, I will save you in tax enough money to go buy another Ferrari. That's, that's, bro, Lamborghini. what kind, like, what a pitch. I'll take it. You know what I mean? And you've done that for me. <laughs> I love it. Uh, very good. Thank you. How about other luxury items? I know watches and that type of thing. You know, I, I see I'm rocking my Apple Watch Ultra uh, and That's it's all very you need. functional. You know, does <laughs> does the job for telling me my time and keeping track of my you know workouts and that type of thing. But uh, yeah, do, do you see other luxury items sort of help build that brand? You know, that uh, hey, look, um, um, I'm, I have I'm, a lot I'm of successful. luxury watches. I probably have like I mean, not that much, I guess, but I have like a few hundred grand of watches mm -hmm. and, um, my friends have watches that are just a few hundred grand in one watch. Right. Um, so there's layers to it. Um, but at the end of the day, I, the watch does nothing compared to what the car does. Mm -hmm. Um, the watch is good for conversation and respect. Like if you're going to business events or entrepreneur events or business owner based events, then yes, you're walking around, you're in close proximity, people look at each other's watches and they gauge, is does this person have money or not from their watch? It is what it is and that's how that environment works. Like when you shake someone's hand, you make a judgment based on what they're wearing and how they're carrying themselves and what they drive uh, about you know what kind of financial situation this person's in. If you're in a business type environment, right? So, mm -hmm. um, and it's just the reality. Um, and so it does help in those environments. People come to be like, damn, that watch is insane. And then we have conversations about it and then now we're friends and we're doing business, but the car is different. The car is like, yep. at least where I live, I don't live in Miami. If I lived in Miami, the car is just another Lamborghini. Yep. Um, but I live in Atlanta and the car is literally like a hundred million dollar private jet. Like mm -hmm. you drive it around and like the people let you park anywhere. They all want to come up and ask you questions. And like, it's just, it's just a different level of experience. Whereas the other luxury stuff, even the watches, shoes, jackets, all that stuff, like, it's just like mm -hmm. for show, yeah. you know, I don't think it creates opportunities. Great. So when we think about the, the typical entrepreneur, uh, and let's, let's just, if we can, let's put them in the, uh, three categories you talked about brick and mortar e-commerce or coaching. Is there like fundamental marketing that people should be doing that you, you're just looking at folks and they're almost all missing, missing it. Like, Hey, stop doing that or start doing this? Yeah, most businesses don't make any content. Mm -hmm. It's the biggest mistake they do. Like, don't, I mean, you follow us. I make content every day for myself, for my company, for my business partners pages um, on multiple platforms um, every single day. 
and mm-hmm. that drives our business like that makes us the most money out of anything and it's just because like if you think about it like these these business owners are trying to do like they they spend too much money to get such little return like they'll spend like 50 grand to make a website but like mm-hmm. they won't they won't spend instead of that why don't we spend 10 grand on a website and 40 grand to bring people to the website so that yeah. there's a point of the building that we're building for people to buy from which is the website right and so i think the biggest mistake people make is like not making content like you don't need to be in all your videos like it's you're running a company but someone needs to be making videos around the mm-hmm. stuff that you guys are doing as a company so that you can reach more people because people are spending four to six hours a day on their phones and someone is buying their attention and it's yep. not you um and sometimes you buy it with money and sometimes you just buy it with content you post organic mm-hmm. content and these Instagrams do such a good, these algorithms do such a good job reaching people uh, exactly where they're at and, you know, finding the people that you want based on what you're selling. So I think just making content is like the biggest mistake I see. And I'll tell you when I coach people, Patrick, and I tell them to make content, it won't, it won't happen overnight. It won't happen in a month. It won't even happen in three months, but a year from the time that mm-hmm. they start their entire business is a completely different operation because they have so much business coming in from non-paid marketing and it's just so important yeah i love that and i think there's some you know i see gary v just talking about just start just it's absolute trash when you get started but that's okay and it will get better nobody's watching anyway when you first get started so like uh just keep showing up and then all of a sudden uh you've got this asset that is is really producing so that's fantastic so when i i think about marketing as an entrepreneur um is there like let's let's assume we're past the like solopreneur you know guy doing it on his own that's making enough money to sort of support his lifestyle we're, we're talking about a real business here what is the what is the dollars i should be thinking about spending on a regular basis to start moving the needle to to drive people in is there is there like a dollar figure like if we're less than x dollars it's not worth it or it all depends on what you're selling, right? Uh, if I'm selling something that costs a hundred thousand dollars, I'd be pretty naive to think I'm going to spend ten dollars a day and get that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to be spending three hundred bucks a month. You're saying I'm going to spend three hundred bucks and get a hundred thousand dollar order? That doesn't make sense, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, now it happens one off, but it's not like an actual consistent marketing strategy. And so uh, it's all really depend on. It. Uh, here's the formula, I guess: is how much does a customer pay me? How much do I profit on that customer? that is the maximum amount of allowable margin I have for marketing. Mm-hmm. Now, how much do I want to keep in profit determines how much my maximum amount of marketing I want to spend is. So if I make $10,000 per customer, I pay five in cost, I have five in profit. How much of that five do I want to keep that still makes it worth it for me? Four grand? Perfect. Then I need to spend $1,000 for each customer that I'm acquiring. If I want to acquire 30 customers per month, I'll need to spend $30,000 this month to do so. And the goal is to get them for less than a thousand dollars, but I'm okay paying up to a thousand dollars to get these customers. And that's really how you work the formula. It's not a one size fits all. And it doesn't, you know, it all depends on what are you selling? How much are you profiting and how much are you willing to cut out of that to get more customers and scale your operations? I love it. That's fantastic. So Eddie, you're one of the sharpest guys I know. Um, really? You're just saying that. The, Come on. No, I appreciate that. You work with a lot actually, of really rich people. It's really irritating how quickly you <laughs> understand things. It's Thank like, <laughs> you'll like be having a conversation, something's happening over here. And all of a sudden you're like, yeah, I fully get that thing that's going on. So, um, <laughs> the reason I say that is like, you're sharp enough. You could do your own financial management, but you're like, look, I, I, I don't, I don't need to figure out my own tax strategy, investment and all that other mm-hmm. stuff. Like, uh, I'm going to hand that off to somebody that is going to be expert at it. And I'm going to stay in my lane and do what I'm best at. That's going to generate as much revenue as possible. I see that with our entrepreneurs, uh, that we work with as well. Like, so what does it, what does it take for somebody to engage with Eddie and bad marketing to like go cool? Look, I, I've maybe been running this or I've got six different people involved in my marketing. I got my, you know, daughter doing my social media and I've got, you know, a friend doing my website and somebody else editing some of my podcast or YouTube videos. Like what does it take to sort of bring all that together under one 
integrated and coordinated strategy with with bad marketing how do they how do they get in touch with you um well they can just go to our website badmarketing.com and uh you can't call us or anything but you can fill out a form an application and then uh, our team will go through the business and reach out to you to basically get on a call and you know do an audit of the company uh externally and internally to see if it is a good fit uh because you know at the end of the day we're in a recurring business and we're trying to build long-term relationships with our clients and partners Mm -hmm. And uh, it doesn't make sense for us to take someone on that we don't really think is going to make money and stick around long term. Short term yeah. cash is cool, but uh, we're trying to build long term cash and relationships. And so uh, we audit every business that we work with. And if you fail the audit for whatever reason, that just means like you're not in a position for us to grow you or you're in a great position. And we just don't feel like we can help much more. Um, mm-hmm. And so, uh, yeah, just going to our website would be the best way. Um, but yeah, I, I, that's that's it- kind of our process. Fantastic. So we'll put we'll put links to badmarketing.com and all your social because uh, people should absolutely check all that out in the show notes. So uh, it's it's entertaining at the very least. So uh, <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you, Patrick. Yeah, Eddie. Thank you so much for being on. I appreciate you sharing your insight uh, as an entrepreneur and also as a uh, an expert in the marketing arena. It's been wonderful. Thanks for having me on, dude. And uh, thanks for saving me so much money every year. Much appreciated. Hopefully, people listening that. take the same choice. All right. Thanks, Eddie.